Did that put me through, guys? I think. Aaron, can you hear me on this line now? Yeah, I'm here. We should, I'm gonna. I'm hanging up the other phone. Okay. Okay. Are you there, Troy? I am. Brian, are you there? All right. Yeah. Okay. Sounds great, Hopefully, everybody. Back, we'll be able to hear her. All right. I was, all right. I I'm going to keep all this standing by in case something happens and I have to refer to it again. All right. It is 3 o'clock Eastern time, so let's get going. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining today's presentation on Conserving the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail. Uh, my name is Brian Fainer and I'm with the National Park Service and help support the National Park Service's Connected Conservation effort. As many of you know, the Connected Conservation webinar series focuses on how the Park Service and our partners can use various tools and strategies to conserve Park Service resources at the landscape and seascape level. We host a webinar at least once a month, and you can find recordings of past webinars in our internal Connected Conservation Toolkit, which is accessible to all Department of Interior staff and on the Network for Landscape Conservation website. The webinar series is open to other federal agencies, state agencies, NGOs, and other partners. And um, I'll shortly here uh, plug in um, links to the internal uh, Connected Conservation Toolkit and then also the Network for Landscape Conservation website. We will post today's webinar following the presentation to the, both of those sites. Throughout the presentation, feel free to plug in questions into the questions box which is on the far right little uh, bar um, that you have under uh, for GoTo webinar. We will host a question and answer session following the presentation and read those questions aloud uh, that have been submitted. And we, for today, we have four fantastic presenters. Uh, Troy Poteet serves to, has served two terms as a Cherokee Nation Tribal Council, a term on the Cherokee Nation Supreme Court, and is a former executive director of the Cherokee National Historical Society. He frequently lectures on Cherokee history and is a storyteller, drawing on tales of his ancestors and their kin to take listeners into the rich world of the Cherokee past. He was a founding member of the Tr National Trails of Trail of Tears Association and currently serves as the executive director. Aaron Marr is a superintendent for the National Trails Intermountain Region. Before becoming superintendent in 2007, he was a historian in the National Trails Office and has also been a historian at the park level and in the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom program. Lee Krauser leads the cultural resources team for the National Trails Intermountain Region, where she has worked as a cultural resource specialist for 16 years. Before coming to the trails office, she was a park archeologist at, at Capitol Reef National Park in South Central Utah for 10 years. Brian Deaton leads the resource information management team for the National Trails Intermountain Region as the GIS specialist. He has worked in federal service for nine years as a GIS specialist and archeologist for the National Park Service and BLM. <coughs> so with that, Aaron and team, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us uh, for the next hour. And um, we're, we're really, really excited to have this opportunity to um, uh, expose a lot of the different aspects of the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail. Uh, many of you have probably heard of the trail or have some familiarity with the, the history, but hopefully through the course of this, uh, this webinar, you'll get a, a more in-depth understanding of the trail, how we, how we work to preserve the trail and to uh, commemorate the story of Cherokee removal and we've got a, a wonderful collection of, uh, of photographs that will enhance the presentation, and you really get a sense of um, of experience in the trail in this kind of um, in this um, in this remote way. So, um, what we're going to do is I'll I'll give a brief introduction to the national trail system. We find that it always helps for people to understand uh, what the trail system is, or at least uh, have a brief um, uh, exposure to that. And I'll speak a little bit about our office, the National Trails Intermountain Region. We're kind of unique in the national 
National Park Service and in federal government, and uh, give a very brief introduction to the uh, the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail and its significance. And then Troy will give you a much a much more in depth understanding of the trail experience and um, what uh, the story and the sites mean to Americans and, and particularly to Cherokee people. Uh, Brian will give a uh, give a uh, an understanding of the of how we use spatial analysis to organize our data and um, understand the, the 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 routes on the trail. And then Lee will give a a presentation on how we work to protect and uh, preserve the resources, what the resources are on the trail, and then how we work with our partners to uh, protect those uh, sites and segments that comprise those real valuable components of the Trail of Tears. So um, let's uh, start off with uh, a real brief primer of the uh, National Trail System. Uh, the trail system is, uh, is, was enacted by, by Congress in 1968, so it was a, a significant uh, congressional action in 1968, which have created the system, and it's been amended since that time, since uh, the last 51 years. Um, it's been amended several times to the point now where it includes 11 national scenic trails and 19 national historic trails. There's also a component of the uh, national trail system, which includes national recreational trails. They're much more localized. Um, unlike national historic or scenic trails, which are created by act of Congress, national recreational trails are, are delegated down to uh, the Secretary of Interior, the Secretary of Agriculture, to establish na national recreational trails. They usually are uh, already on federal property. They're much shorter in their length. And um, again, they're much more localized. And you see the map of the um, of the trail system there to the right, so you get a sense of how it really spans the entire country. And uh, we don't have, I don't think you see the trails up in, uh, there is one trail um, I did a ride up in Alaska and Alakakai in um, Hawaii, but you see in the continental US the, um, the, uh, the extent of the national trail system. Um, I'll look specifically at the trails that we administer out of our office, we administer nine national historic trails. And you see they transcend local, state, uh, administrative boundaries, uh, Park Service regional boundaries. They really span the entire country and they transcend any of our normal understandings of, of states, at least in our administrative activities. Um, just looking at the nine national historic trails, you'll probably recognize many of them and you'll recognize either an event that's being commemorated, a nationally historic event, such as the, uh, say, the Mormon Pioneer National Historic Trail, which looks at the original Mormon emigration routes from uh, now Boulain, Illinois, to uh, the Salt Lake Valley in Utah, an event in 1846, 1847. Um, or it might look at processes like the uh, Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, which uh, went from Mexico City and crossed into the U.S. in El Paso, and then it went up to Santa Fe in New Mexico. And this was uh, used over the course of centuries in trade and commerce and settlement into the uh, Southwest United States. Uh, Pony Express National Historic Trail, which commemorates a, uh, a route used by the Pony Express from St. Joe in Missouri to, um, to San Francisco. So these are long distance trails that commemorate nationally historic, nationally significant events. You see the, uh, the date they were established, they were established by Congress, so it takes a congressional action to establish National Historic Trails. And you see that they're lengthy. They're, uh, in most cases, thousands of miles long, um, commemorating uh, these events that went over our landscape for great distances. Um, if, uh, if you're in the National Park Service, you recognize that we have web pages for each of, our, uh, each of our national historic trails. So if you have a particular interest in say the uh, Old Spanish Trail, there's a web page that's uh, popular with a lot of fantastic data, uh, including trail alignments and history and um, information on visiting the trails, all those things you'd expect to see on a standard National Park Service page you'd see on our, our trail web pages. And you might also recognize that each trail has a logo 
It has an official logo that we mark the trail with or we mark interpreter media with. And that provides kind of that national level recognition and that national context. So where you, wherever you are on the Trail of Tears of the Santa Fe Trail, you hopefully see the logo and that can give you the confidence to know that you're on the trail and that you're following a nationally significant um, uh, element of our history. So as trail administrators, we, um, we have some specific responsibilities. We provide that kind of representation trail-wide. Um, we uh, work diligently to identify and advocate for the protection of historic features along the trail. And we have something called high potential sites and segments, which are those most important elements of the trail that are available for public, uh, public enjoyment, public education. I showed you the logo. We manage logo use for marking and for road and site signs. Uh, we establish interpretive standards in themes and interpretive media. Uh, we provide technical assistance to willing partners in trail protection, education, interpretation, media development. Um, so that the key word there is willing because there's nothing compulsory about the National Trail System Act on non-federal land. And uh, as trail administrators, we're not involved in land management. We provide technical assistance and limited financial assistance, but we have no land management authorities. So we provide that, that type of service to willing partners, whether landowners, organizations, tribes, or uh, agency partners. So the Trail of Tears was designated as part of the National Trail System in 1987. And at that time, it included approximately 2,400 miles and included two representative routes. So you see the, the routes that it include now on the right-hand side in the, those light blue uh, lines. But um, originally, out of the original legislation, uh, included only two representative routes, a, a water route and a land route. However, there was significant um, uh, advocacy for comprehensively recognizing the experience of, uh, of charity removal. So there was additional legislation in 2009, which added basically all the collection routes that, uh, that uh, emerged out of the, uh, the forts in the, old, uh, in the old Cherokee Nation in uh, Georgia and Alabama and North Carolina and Tennessee to the emigration routes. And then several, all of the, pri all of the routes that were used to lead the detachments of Cherokee to uh, the disbandment routes in, um, in Oklahoma and in far western Arkansas. So what you see now in the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail is really a comprehensive uh, commemoration of all the routes followed by the Cherokee um, in 1838 and 1839. So it's really, uh, it's really a, a, a broad, expansive collection of all of those different experiences on the, um, uh, during that removal, during the forced removal. National significance is really critical to understanding um, which routes were included. Uh, the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail commemorates the forced removal of the Cherokee Nation, 1838 to 1839, includes all of those land and water routes that were followed by over 16,000 Cherokee who were forced to move from traditional homelands in the southeast United States to those newly assigned lands in what was then known as Indian Territory in today's Oklahoma. Uh, the removal experience varied. From, fam from families to families. Some traveled by foot, many traveled by horse and wagon, even railroad and boat in the detachments of up to a thousand people uh, as they traveled to Oklahoma. So that's a very, very brief introduction to the trail system, the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail, and, um, and the significance in designating the, um, the trail but I'm going to turn it over to Troy now, who'll give you a better understanding of the meaning and the meaning of the landscape and the story of the Trail of Tears. Well, I think that uh, as we discuss the preservation, the interpretation of the sites and the landscapes and the structures along these routes that our ancestors followed uh, during the forced removal, 
for Cherokees, it's very important that the general public understand why we vigorously com, uh, uh, join in the commemoration uh, of this very sad and very thin slice of Cherokee history. We participate in locating uh, exactly where the roots went in the marking and in interpretation and in commemorative ceremonies not because we want to capture the memory of our ancestors in the role of victims and certainly they were victimized they were victims of greed um, and a failing of uh, the the best part of the United States that we hold dear uh, and certainly we don't participate in all of this activity around the Trail of Tears because we want to somehow appropriate that victimization to ourselves. None of us alive today came on the trail and nobody alive today had anything to do with that. Um, For us, and I, I say this because I speak to this often and have for a quarter century, and I know that hardly any Cherokees disagree about this, and that is that we join in this effort to tell this story because it gives us opportunity to honor our ancestors who endured the Trail of Tears, to honor their resilience and their tenacity and their perseverance and their sheer will to survive as a distinct people. Their will that the Cherokee Nation survived, they did that, they did overcome, they did hand the Cherokee Nation off to the next generation as a very vital and viable political entity with our language and our history and our culture intact. Now, that being said, I want to also say that we uh, appreciate that sense of place that um, we're able to enjoy when we go to one of the segments of the Trail of Tears that is in uh, great condition, like at Pea Ridge on Telegraph Road, where you see an image of uh, people uh, walking, walking up the trail with flags and the whole the tribal community uh, participating, or at Red Clay, the image that you uh, see where the tribal council had to meet because it was just across the Tennessee line, and Tennessee didn't interfere with the workings of our government the way uh, the state of Georgia did in an effort to rid us so that lottery winners could take our farms and, and homes. Um, you see an image um, looking from Removal Park in Missouri across the wide Mississippi uh, to an area on the Illinois side where hundreds of several thousand Cherokees uh, camped in the winter because the ice in the Mississippi was so great that boats would fall apart trying to cross it. It would destroy the boats. And so people had to camp between where you see the water in that uh, mountain in the background. Several detachments were spread out there and many people froze to death during that time. Um, so those places uh, give us a sense of place and we um, think that, and well, we know because we've participated, people from the local communities, partners, who, without whom we could never have been able to mark the removal routes accurately and interpret them. And these partners, many of them work through the Trail of Tears Association. They help us locate, they help us come up with the scholarship and make uh, assemble all the documentation that we need in order to share that story of what happened along the trail with the general public. And every time that story is told, it gives us, as modern Cherokees, 
an opportunity to honor our ancestors and to share with the general public that we are not a footnote in history, but we're a, a living, uh, viable political entity and cultural entity on this continent. And we're very much a part of the um, the landscape uh, uh, of America. And so the demarcation of the roots and the interpretation along the way gives us an opportunity to connect with people in local communities all through the southeast, all through the states where those various routes pass. That's a connecting place. That's an intersection between us and some little community in the Ozarks in Missouri where we can go and learn about them, learn about what else happened in their neighborhood, share with them uh, our history and culture. So um, I think that uh, that's uh, what the the uh, trail means to us. And um, Aaron, the, I can't think of anything else that I want to share right at the moment, but uh, if someone prompts me, I'll... Uh, come again and say more otherwise I'll wait until the end and uh, um, well, uh, thank you Troy. the time for questions this is uh, Brian Deaton the GIS specialist for the National Trails Intermountain Region um, as, we, as we just heard the trail tiers is nationally significant significant to the Cherokee people and has important locations that provide a sense of place the only way to preserve the sense of place for these locations and along the trail is to have an understanding of the geographical location of, of them. The resource information management team is tasked with the database development and management of the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail and the geographic information systems uh, data spanning nine states. This data is essential to take into account landscape level protection for the trail and development and promotion to interpret or provide public access to trail properties. As you can tell from the map, the trail data is complex and crosses many different land jurisdictions, so working with willing partners is essential to create relationships regarding trail data. Brian? Yes. It's Troy, and I would just uh, say, I, I guess I failed to mention that Cherokee youth from both the Eastern Band and from the Cherokee Nation, each summer, uh, they pick out one of these routes and follow it on bicycles, and they, they, they do that bicycle ride. And I just want to point out that the reason they're able to do that is because of the work that the Park Service has done in conjunction with local communities. Otherwise, we wouldn't know where to commemorate that ride, and that's a prime example of the import of your work to the Cherokees. And so I'm sorry to interrupt you, just to interject that. Yep. So the, the designated alignment is based upon the route as depicted within the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail Comprehensive Management Plan and the subsequent additional routes feasibility study. Specifically, the route segments are based upon uh, various historical documentation sources, including military records, other historical maps, general land office maps, and historians, land managers, landowners, and other trail experts' knowledge. Working with partners is an essential part of mapping the National Historic Trail. Through our relationships with the Trail Association, land managers, historians, trail experts, universities, and other partners, our knowledge of the trail and associated resources on the ground has increased every year. 
Newer data sources that are becoming more readily available include LIDAR, light detection and ranging, historic aerial imagery, GPS data, historic documentation and maps, and high resolution imagery. LIDAR is a ro remote sensing technique being utilized more because it's no longer as cost prohibitive as it once was to acquire. Based upon processed airborne LIDAR point clouds and elevation model derivatives, the ground surface of a given area can be created with the vegetation stripped from the data. The sun angle and direction can be manipulated to enable easier detection of features on the ground. This data can provide a way to see linear features that would otherwise be undetectable due to vegetation cover. So as you can see here, this is a, a, um, an, an area that was acquired, LIDAR was acquired in, in Oklahoma. So you can see that you can, there's, there's different linear features that you can detect based upon the uh, bare earth derivative. Historic aerial imagery provides a valuable source of information concerning features on the ground. There are some areas of the U.S. that have historic soil conservation service aerial imagery going back to the 30s. This can provide a snapshot of the trail before development impacted or destroyed its physical trace. Most of our data for our office that we receive from partners is in the form of GPS data or data based upon historic maps. The GPS data is provided by partners who have ground truth the physical trace of the trail as either part of their own research or due to cultural resource inventory. This is an example of uh, historic documentation uh, this is a general land office plat from the 1800s in Arkansas. And as you can see, the, um, a, a road is indicated by the surveyor on the map, and, and that is the, the, the designated trail. That is, that is one of the, the routes um, that was taken by the Cherokee people. Another source of data is high resolution imagery that can also provide better insights into the physical location of the trail on the ground. This imagery at higher resolutions than one meter can, can enable the detection of linear features that would otherwise be undetectable with lower resolution imagery. So in this case, this is um, uh, high resolution imagery from, from Oklahoma that's um, Six inch resolution. The National Trails Intermountain Region conducts analysis of the current land management along the trail to review any updates to the land ownership or management in proximity to the designated alignment. This analysis allows the office to make updated points of contact with land managers assist in identifying areas that may have future development impacting the setting of the trail or other associated resources, and assist in identifying areas that may have some level of protection based upon special land designation. We also um, conduct viewshed analysis and uh, hillshade creation among other uh, spatial analysis things. So here's an example of, of um, creating a viewshed analysis based upon a specific location uh, along the trail and seeing uh, um, what can be seen from, from that location. So this would be um, take, trying to take into account the setting and, and 
understanding the, the impacts to the setting of a particular location. The National Trails Intermountain Region provides technical assistance and expertise to partners regarding GIS technology, analysis, and peripherals. This assistance may include spatial analysis of landscape level phenomena, including view sheds and visibility analysis, uh, field data collection methodology, or technical expertise in coordination with the cultural resources team to, to partner land managers in their development of NEPA or Section 106 documents relating to undertakings in proximity to the, to the trail. So here you can see some of the, the, um, the different uh, land ownership associated uh, or across uh, in proximity to the, to the designated route of the trail. An example of uh, the field data collection methodology um, assistance that our office provides is, is the uh, historic building inventory that Middle Tennessee State University undertook. This is an example of, of, of landscape level inventory since they did it across the, uh, the, the span of, of the National Historic Trail. Um, the, Resource Information Management Team ensured that the correct data standards and schemas were utilized by the partner and provided instruction on field data collection applications and GPS units. Now I'll turn it over to Lee to discuss the Cultural Resources Team. As you've heard um, several times now, the Trail of Tears holds enormous cultural meaning and significance to the Cherokees and to other Native communities that were removed from the southeast to Oklahoma in 1838 and 1839. As the Trail of Tears National Historic Trails Administrators, we work with these tribes and other partners to help protect and preserve trail resources. That's the main focus of NTIR's cultural resources team. The trail has many different kinds of historic resources on public and private lands. They include the physical trail and road remnants, such as this original segment of the Trail of Tears at Crowley's Ridge in Village Creek State Park, Eastern Arkansas. Trail remnants can appear differently depending on local conditions. Now, um, it's largely through forested areas. Um, but there are differences, and these are just a few of the ways that the Trail of Tears is manifested across the length. There are important natural elements along the trail, such as this witness tree, which was a sapling at Metal Rock, Kentucky, when the Cherokee detachment passed by, and the Blue Hole, which is a spring of tremendous cultural significance at the Red Clay Council Grounds in Tennessee. And you'll hear more about that place shortly. Archaeological sites, including detachment camping areas, are abundant along the trail. Some are detectable only by geophysical means. Some have visible ruins or foundations of original buildings and some include subsurface features that can tell us about the activities that occurred there. Now the forts referenced in these photos are places where the Cherokees were gathered in preparation for starting along the removal trail. There are quite a few standing buildings along the trail. They include plantation houses, log cabins, and structures such as retaining walls, chimneys, and bridge abutments from the removal period. And if you look at the photograph in the lower left corner, that's a bridge abutment. And uh, look at the lower center. Behind that bush, there's a, a man standing with his arms outstretched. That gives you a, a sense of the size of that particular structure. 
Some of these were built and used by the Cherokees themselves. Some are stores or supply depots um, or are located where detachments stopped and camped. And some were witness buildings, which were simply buildings that were present as the detachments passed by. And so the people walking by there um, would have seen them at that time. Many of these today belong to private landowners, nonprofit organizations, and state parks who are interested in working with us to preserve their trail of tears resources. Along the trail are farms, plantations, settlements, and other kinds of trail properties, including trail trace with acreage and intact settings that we consider to be cultural landscapes. And that's really for us the most exciting part of this. It's what we want to protect and preserve the cultural landscape because it provides a geographical and historical context for the individual elements. When you're standing in these places, you can really imagine what it was like to be there at the, during the period of significance. The National Park Service defines cultural landscape as a geographic area, including both cultural and natural resources and the wildlife or domestic animals therein, associated with a historic event, activity, or person, or exhibiting other cultural or aesthetic values. There are four kinds of cultural landscapes, and all of them are found on the Trail of Tears. Ethnographic landscapes, which are important to and still used by Cherokees for special cultural and ceremonial purposes. Historic site landscapes, like this rail corridor, where some Cherokees were boarded onto to a train to cross the area. Historic vernacular landscapes, which are landscapes that were created by the day-to-day -day activities of the people who lived there. And historic design landscapes with formal arrangements of ornamental plants and fences. So how do we protect trail resources? We can't do it directly. NHTs are not linear national parks. And as you heard, um, NTIR does not have land management authority along the trail. We do it through our work um, with partners. Through cooperative agreements and contracts, we provide our partner organizations and landowners and land managers with technical expertise and funding support for various kinds of documentation, studies, and activities. These include documentary survey, um, which consists of collecting historical documentation, such as historical maps, National Register nominations, newspaper clippings, and so forth, for a Trail of Tears related properties. Archaeological investigation, including LIDAR and satellite photo analysis, done in conjunction with our uh, resource information management team, and uh, traditional field survey, geophysical survey, metal detection, and archaeological testing building and structure surveys and assessments where qualified resource specialists seek out buildings and structures that are historically related to the Trail of Tears and assess the conditions and needs of those resources. Cultural landscape inventories and assessments to identify cultural landscapes, research their histories, and assess their existing condition and integrity. This groundwork feeds directly into developing National Register nominations and listings. And um, altogether, these efforts document trail resources for posterity and for management and preservation purposes, compile information that is useful for interpretation, and heighten public awareness and appreciation of NHT resources. Here's an example of a National Register nomination that we're supporting right now through a cooperative agreement with Middle Tennessee State University. This is for a mile-long original roadbed um, of the old Jefferson Road, which runs along the north side of the river. And it, um, you can, if you look at the map, um, you'll see the, the uh, road that parallels that river. Um, it's called Jefferson Pike. And I'll just, um, I'd just like to point out here that, that this is a common destiny for trail alignments. Um, the people that created them, especially designed roads, pick the best way for a road to go. And those have evolved into modern highways. So that's how a lot of original trail and uh, roadbed have been lost. Um, this was uh, a turnpike, a toll road built in 1805 in Tennessee. Today it's on US Army Corps of Engineer land. Between 1838 and 39, more than 4,000 Cherokees passed this way en route to Indian Territory. And the nomination right now is being finalized for submittal. Here's an example of a cultural landscape inventory from Middle Tennessee State University for Red Clay State Park. Now, 
some people consider red clay to be the actual beginning of the Trail of Tears. After the state of Georgia used military force to prevent Cherokee government from uh, meeting at the tribal capital at New Echota, the tribal government moved across the state line uh, to, count, to the Red Clay County Ground in southeastern Tennessee. And this remained the Cherokee capital until the people were forcibly removed in 1838. Today, it's a 263-acre epigraphic cultural landscape protected by the state of Tennessee as Red Clay State Park. Cherokee people still hold cultural events at the old council grounds, and the young men in this photograph on the left are cooling off in the Blue Hole Spring by permission of the park after a sporting event. This <coughs> inventory identified historic resources that helped define the cultural landscape. We also developed treatment plans and guidance, and uh, here are two restoration guides for log and masonry buildings along the Trail of Tears and a treatment plan for historic farmstead. Different kinds of treatment we recommend can include stabilization or moth falling, which is taking action to stop deterioration that usually occurs through uh, neglect or abandonment. Preservation, which addresses how we can help owners make historically sensitive decisions about repairs and other work on their property. Rehabilitation. Finding ways to adapt a property to new uses while retaining its historic character. Restoration, removing non-historical elements of a building or landscape to regain its historic appearance. And reconstruction, recon recreating a vanished building or landscape with new materials. Here's an example of one of our stabilization efforts on the Trail of Tears. James Brown was a Cherokee leader, and he established his farmstead northeast of Chattanooga between 1828 and 1838, when he was forced off his land. It included this brick home, which you see here as it appeared in 1910. It's already old, but it's well maintained. Um, that didn't uh, stand, though, and it uh, deteriorated. And in 2006, Steve Burns of our staff learned of the building's uh, imminent collapse and reached out to the National Park Service Historic Preservation Projects Program for help. Our office supported a challenge cost share project with Tennessee Preservation Trust to hold an on-site workshop in cooperation with the Heritage Conservation Network and the property owner to figure out what could be done. During the workshop, the partners physically stabilized the old house and compiled some preservation recommendations. But the recommendations, for the most part, were not implemented because of cost, and the plan um, eventually became out of date. So in 2016, we entered a cooperative agreement with Middle Tennessee State, again, to develop a new preservation plan for the site. And last year, an updated, detailed plan was delivered to us. Next steps will be to work with the Tennessee Historical Commission and Tennessee Preservation Trust for technical assistance and for help pursuing funding to implement the plan's recommendations. Another large part of our protection effort consists of participating in NEPA and Section 106 compliance for external undertakings. That is projects that are led by other federal agencies and that have potential to adversely affect the trail. We participate in scoping for those undertakings. Um, some federal agencies who are supposed to manage the trail in their jurisdictions don't even realize where it is or that they need to manage for it or that this office exists and has data and expertise that can help them to do that. We review environmental impact statements, often for large projects like transmission lines, highway construction, pipelines, and wind energy development. But sometimes for smaller projects like communications towers, um, and um, usually those aren't environmental impact um, statements, but um, other kinds of compliance. Um, at one point, um, we were given a proposal for a disc golf course. That's a, a, an example of the smaller kinds of projects that we review. Uh, we accept cooperating agency status for these undertakings when it's appropriate, when we have the staff capacity. We usually do that when we can be of meaningful assistance in identifying the trail, potential impacts, and ways to avoid or mitigate impact. And we ask to be consulted for Section 106 so that we can be part of that discussion for identifying appropriate mitigation. We want to try to ensure that mitigation is proportionate to the impact and that it makes a meaningful difference to the trail and to the visitor. 
here's a current example of our involvement in a forest service undertaking. It's kind of a different one. On the, the left, you see a photo of the Unicoi Turnpike. The Unicoi was uh, originally an ancient footpath connecting the Overhill Cherokee towns in Tennessee to the Cherokee settlement in the Carolinas and Georgia. Historically, it was developed into a toll road, and some 3,000 Cherokees from Western North Carolina traveled this road during removal. Because of its history and because of its part, because parts of it are still largely intact and in a natural setting, um, consulting Cherokee tribes consider this section of the NHD to be especially sensitive. In 2015, um, forest personnel excavated 35 trenches about three feet deep across uh, less than a mile section of the old roadbed for purposes of erosion control prior to proper NEPA and Section 106 consideration or tribal consultation. The crew doing the work didn't realize it was a historic roadbed. They thought that what they were doing was routine maintenance. So the forest is now working closely with the tribes, our office, and SHPO to remediate and mitigate that damage. Other NTIR teams are also in, indirectly involved in our pres preservation protection efforts. Trail mapping and GIS is critical to our efforts, as is the day-to-day -day work of our interpretive and design teams. By interpreting the trail of tears and making it accessible to visitors, we educate the public about the trail and help them learn to care for it. If they care about the NHP resources, they're more likely to make their voices heard when those special places are threatened by neglect or development. And that uh, sums up our presentation. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Lee and, and Brian and Troy. Um, I, I hope that uh, that gives everybody that's participating a, a good sense of, uh, of uh, National Historic Trails in general, but the Trail of Tears in particular. Um, you see kind of the span of our activities and you see the highly technical nature of our activities, but you also got some insight into what the meaning of that work is. And um, I think Troy very eloquently stated, especially in his amendment to his presentation, how, how people today use the trail and connect to it in very meaningful ways, especially, um, especially youth like the bike riders who benefit from all the technical work that's gone into this um, and the, the close partnership we have with the Cherokee Nation to create these opportunities for people to come and connect either to their heritage or to the, or for all Americans to come and to, um, to experience and to understand um, this rather significant and, um, and profound part of our, of our history. So Brian, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I think you're gonna help us with um, any potential questions. Great. Well, thanks again uh, for the great presentation. All right, again, uh, folks, if you have questions for the uh, presenters, uh, please enter them into the questions tab, and then I'll uh, I'll ask them to the team. <clears throat> okay, so we've got a couple already here. Um, how many other national trails have the amount of data and level of accuracy you have you all have been able to acquire for this trail? It, it, it really depends on the trail and, and what the, the, the documentation is and um, the land jurisdiction and the, the, how engaged the partners are and, and how um, interested a, a other other knowledgeable, knowledgeable individuals um, are, um, you know, uh, most of our our trails, the the, the um, scale of data that we have is at, at the 100k um, scale, but that uh, the intended use of the data is 100k. But from various sources, just like with the with the trail tiers, we, we've got varying different levels of, of scale of data ranging from you know gps data a physical trace on the ground to um you know 100 100k quad maps where the the route has been plotted 
on on those USGS quad maps by a, by a historian based upon their knowledge. So so it really varies. Great. All right, here's another one for you guys. Um, okay. So there's a lot coming in now. Hold on, hold on one second. Um, does the NPS collect or record data, um, GIS or otherwise, for trail remnants or cultural resources that may be historically associated with a given historical trail, but not included in the Congressional National Heritage Trail designation? If so, how is this information made available to the public, SHPO's, tribes, and other federal agencies, et cetera? Well, I can I can um, perhaps uh, lead off that question, and, and Brian might have some additional information. But as I understand it, you're asking us if we collect data on um, on perhaps non-designated segments, or perhaps uh, routes that um, other tribes may have used, or uh, or that are simply uh, associated routes that may not be designated as National Historic Trail but might have some association to the uh, historical event. And the answer is uh, generally, generally no, we don't go out of our way to do that. And a lot of it is a capacity issue, um, but it also is just uh, what our direction is to do, is to, is to map and to document the, the National Historic Trail. Um, so we, we generally, do not collect other data, uh, mostly because we don't have the capacity. But, um, you know, that, as I mentioned, there were two stages in the creation of the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail when it was first designated. It only included the two primary routes used by the majority of the Cherokee who were removed. But during that same time period, 1938 and 39, there were other Cherokee detachments that traveled on other routes and also uh, experienced the, the, the roundup um, during the early, early stages of, of the removal. And those actually were routes. Those were routes. Those were remnants on the ground or, or part of the history of the removal. So um, we, ex we acknowledge that those were associated parts of the story. So we did. Uh, maintain a database that um, that uh, recognized all these additional routes and um, these ad additional features of the um, of the Trail of Tears experience. And then in 2009, when we were asked to um, study these additional routes for a potential addition, um, we had that information. We had that that database of um, of routes and um, and quite specific information on where the routes went and um, what the resources were they're affected by the removal. So, you know, to a certain extent it varies a little bit, but in general, we try not to uh, expand our activities too far beyond what our, what our um, authorized mandates are, because we just don't have the ability to, uh, to expand that far beyond what we, what, what we have to do. Um, Brian, is there anything you want to add to that? Or Lee or Troy? Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely correct, um, and and you know it's it's definitely a data man partly a data management issue where we don't want to um, be trying to to manage um, data that is extraneous to the the National Historic Trail itself, and we don't want to end up being a uh, a clearinghouse or a repository of of, of data and and have it that. Um, individuals are trying to access that data data through us when when it should be accessed through um, SHPOs or or the individual um, land management agencies cultural resources program. All right, here's another one for you. How receptive are private landowners that the trail goes through? And I'm going to add on to that also. Um, 
have are our land trusts involved with preserving some of those private land tracks? I'll again just start off the response there, and um, you know, a significant amount of the uh, of the trail, particularly uh, particularly towards it, well, particularly towards its western end uh, with the Trail of Tears, but really looking at all national historic trails, um, significant amounts go over private land or non-federal land. You know, it could go through state parks, as you've seen some examples here, um, county parks, tribal land. Um, so wherever it goes over non-federal land, um, it really is an issue of engaging that landowner and seeing if there's a willingness to participate in any way. It could be just documenting the trail on private property. It could be actually developing it for visitor access. It could be for developing it for viewer access from, uh, from a roadside pullout so people can overlook. But, um, you know, the, the response to, from private landowners varies, of course. Um, some landowners are very, very protective of, um, of their privacy and their land rights, and they really want nothing to do with, um, with the trail system, and that's just fine. That's the, again, there's no compulsory action um, with uh, National Historic Trail designation on non-federal land. But, um, over and over again, we're surprised by the receptive nature of private landowners. Private landowners are proud, in the vast majority of cases, to, um, to own these significant components of our shared history. Um, in an amazing amount of cases, and I, I'd say this is probably a substantial majority of the cases, private landowners are eager to share their land with the American public in any number of ways. It could be just viewing it from the road. It could be very limited access on a, you know, once a, once a year, uh, they may lead tours once a, once a month, once a week. In some cases, they have unrestricted access to uh, visit the historic site on their property. So we're, we're just constantly amazed by how uh, Americans are um, eager to um, provide protection for their uh, for their resources, but also share it and help all Americans to understand the significance of those sites. And Lee, you've done a lot of work uh, uh, on on uh, private land, and I, I don't know if you'd want to add to that. Um, most of my experience has been farther west on some of the other NHTs, um, and I I think that. Landowners on the Trail of Tears may just be exceptionally um, <laughs> willing to work with us. Um, there are definitely great landowners on uh, the Western Trails that um, are, are also proud of their properties, especially I think on the Santa Fe Trail. But in other places uh, farther west, I think we run more into the um, anti-government crunch maybe, that kind of um, uh, philosophy, personal philosophy, and um, sometimes it's a challenge even to get permission to look at the trail on private land. Uh, so it, it, as Aaron said, it's different. Um, it's different everywhere. How about with the, the land trust piece? Are there, are, are some of the land trusts that the, the trail crosses, do, do, do any of them reach out to you all and trying to help with protecting the trail that is on private land? I've, I've not seen them uh, reach out to us myself. Maybe Aaron has some experience with that. Generally, um, we are trying to reach out to them, um, sometimes to help us with a, you know, a, some possible mitigation for compliance or um, some trying to encourage some private um, protection uh, for, for a trail resource. But um, okay. yeah, I think I think we could do more in that area for sure. Well, there and the Trust for Public Lands uh, help us uh, with a piece very near to the Chief Van House in Cartersville, Georgia, and the uh, National Battlefield Trust uh, recently uh, help 
uh, in preservation of uh, the Brown Brown's Ferry Tavern and some things like that, important sites um, connected with the trail. Great. Yeah, because we don't manage land, we don't seek uh, uh, National Park Service stewardship of land. Um, we have kind of a, a, a toolkit of um, different strategies that we can re recommend to partners to advocate for land protection. And you know those those include working with shippos and other entities for um, for uh, easements over property. In some cases, uh, nonprofits groups have uh, pursued outright fee simple acquisition of uh, of significant resources. And we've also been advocating for um, for land trusts to become more involved in um, in protecting trail resources. So it's really kind of in its nascent stages of getting land trust more involved in the land protection. But as um, as, as Troy has pointed out, uh, there are some cases along, particularly along the Trail of Tears, where land trusts have been engaged and have been very successful in protecting certain components of uh, of the trail. Great. Okay, we're at. Um four o'clock Eastern time. Uh, Aaron and, and, and folks, any uh, last not last words for to share? Just thanks for everybody's time and we're we're grateful to have this opportunity. Hopefully it hopefully was a, a good contribution to the webinar series. Absolutely was. Um, folks I, I put in the chat box a, a link to our next uh, connected Conservation uh, webinar. It's going to be on August 13 at 4 o'clock Eastern Time, and it's on uh, connectivity in the Pacific Northwest National Scenic Trail. And that's the, the scenic trail that crosses through the Northwest, cr crosses through North Cascades, and over to Glacier National Park. Um, so you can uh, register that there uh, in the chat box, or again by visiting our page on the Network for Landscape Conservation or our internal. Um, Park Service Connected Conservation Toolkit. All right. Well, thank you again so much, uh, Aaron, Lee, Troy, Brian. Um, awesome presentation. You guys got your hands full with managing a really complicated and expansive uh, and amazingly important trail. So <laughs> thank you for all you do, and especially to you, Troy, and your association. I mean, um, thank you. I mean, you you all, you all are, are such a great partner. Um, and, and for everything, obviously, with, with the trail. So thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, we're glad to have the opportunity to share. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Are we gone?